Hey everybody, it's Aloy, and uh, welcome back to Aloy's Vlog. Uh, today is going to be a design discussion, um, and less actually of a design discussion, but I was recently watching a video from the IGDN um, YouTube feed, and I'll put a link to that below, and it was about how to run a good convention game. Now, for Third Eye Games, uh, I've had... Uh, a document that I put together kind of the rules uh, and the things that I like to do whenever I'm running a convention game and whenever I have uh, a GM who's going to be running a game for me at a convention or whatever I try and I give them a copy of the document uh, so they, they can try and run it you know as close to the way um, that I try to as well uh, but you know what I thought was, hey, I have this nifty channel. Let's just go ahead and talk about it. Let's let, let me share it with everybody, um, and it means that I can send any future GMs uh, or anybody who wants to run games for Third Eye Games can come here and check out this video. So step one, preparation. All right. Now there's there's so we have different steps and then there's sub steps for every step. So the first step with preparation is be familiar with the rules, all right? Um, the GM should definitely have read uh, the, the rules at least once or twice throughout the, you know, through the book. This isn't to say that you have to know every rule or detail, like down to the nitty gritty with unparalleled prowess and like that's, you know, like we don't need everybody to be a rules lawyer. Like that's no fun. All right, but well enough that if people ask general questions about either the setting or the mechanics, you're able to answer those and not get stumbled and not have to go, uh, let me look that up. Now, on that note as well, don't be afraid to say, oh, well, you know what? Let me get, let me just take a second real quick and check that, that rule out. There's nothing wrong with that either, as long as it doesn't take too long. Uh, but never make your players wait for a rules question if it can be avoided. So, um, the next thing is always use pregens. Um, and now again, this is for convention games. Um, people who go to conventions don't like to sit there and make up game, make up characters unless uh, making up characters is part of the fun of the session and can be uh, put into the same slot. Like if they can make characters uh, and it's easy enough to do and they can still go through the adventure and not have any kind of hiccups, then you can do that. I do that a lot with uh, my kids' games with Mermaid Adventures, Infestation, uh, and RPG of Bugs and Heroes, and Camp Myth. A lot of the time I'll make uh, characters with the kids first and then we'll go on the adventure. But for the most part, uh, any other game that I run, if it's not for kids, uh, I always bring pregens. It's always going to do you better, uh, and it's easy that usually the pregens, at least the ones that Third Eye Games provides, they're all in the same format and everything, so you can just go through the rules effort with everybody together, um, and it works out well. Uh, you know, the good thing about pregens is that you can basically spend, um, you know, 10, 15 minutes at the very beginning, kind of do a quick info dump, and then move on as opposed to, you know, so much time that you'd be using for making characters that you could be playing instead. All right, and this might sound like a silly one, but eat before you play, all right? So obviously bring a drink uh, of water or whatever so that you can stay hydrated, you can clear your throat, um, but don't bring meals to your table. Uh, it shows a level of like unpreparedness that like, you know, it's, it's, I don't know, it's like, oh, like, you couldn't even eat before he got here. I mean, being there, ready to run your games is the number one priority. So, like, as soon as you get to the table. So, I mean, of course, if you want to bring snacks and offer them to the group, like, that's a whole other thing. Like, hey, everybody, I brought this for the table. That's, you know, completely different. But if, you like, you, you know, just needed to eat lunch, like, I would say, like, stay outside and eat lunch and then come into your table so that you are like there and people it's it's perception right also what's perception is the next sub step and that's dress for the occasion okay so uh whenever people are running games for me i always suggest that they wear uh a third eye games t-shirt for the game that they're running uh if they don't have one you know all they have to do is ask me and i can get them one because i have tons of t-shirts um, that I can give to my GM, so that's pretty easy. Uh, but it's always good, like, to have that sort of thing so that people can walk in 
and they can go, I'm here to play part-time gods. Oh, that guy has a part-time god shirt on. All right, cool. That must be the guy. Um, you know, or girl, actually. Uh, Carol Darnell is actually the one who, who runs a lot of my games right now. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, just in general terms, that's the GM because they're wearing the shirt of the game that I'm going to play. And it just makes for uh, recognizability. All right, the next thing is bring a copy of the book. All right, so whenever you're running a game, you should have a copy of the physical book there so that the players can look through it. Um, it's good for them to flip through. Um, if they're really interested in how everything is working, then they can kind of they can kind of look deeper into the book and be like, oh, that's how that would work, um, even if it has nothing to do with the current scene that's going on. Uh, so a lot of the time, it's always good to have one. Um, if you don't have a physical copy, uh, most times if you contact the company that who made the game that you're running, I know Third Eye Games does this, we'll spot you a physical copy of the book if you want to have one for your table. Uh, you know, it's most, it, you are doing an undeniable service for the company that you are running a game for. You are spreading that message. You are, you are sharing that game with people and it's an amazing thing and we, we all thank you. All I, I will speak on behalf of all game designers. We all thank you for doing it. Trust me. Um, all right, so I think the last one... Oh, there's two more. So uh, the last one, next to last one for preparedness is positioning. All right? So positioning is um, no matter what game you're running, so it's important that you control your game and that you have uh, that you position yourself in a good way in order to uh, command the table. Uh, we're not talking about the story itself or trying to railroad play or decisions or anything like that, but it means that you need to uh, make yourself the person in charge of the game and setting the tone of interaction between all the players. So if you have the opportunity, obviously there are some times where you just can't, but if you can Take a position where your back is to the wall, okay? So that means that the players the players are looking at you, and there isn't anything uh, more interesting behind you. There's nothing distracting there. Um, you know, and also try and have them sit as closely as you can uh, so uh, to you so that you can make sure that you hear them all, make sure they can all hear each other. Again, it depends on the, the atmosphere and whatever. Every con is kind of different. Uh, but what this does is it uh, asserts you as the one that they should pay attention to. And again, it helps you keep control of the game and keep everyone on task, especially at a convention where there's lots of stuff going on and you kind of want to make sure that you can get through um, whatever you're running. All right. Um, so if your legs get... I always suggest that you stand... Uh, while you're running the game, if your legs get tired, I say you bring over a chair and you kind of lean on one knee on the chair. Um, again, not everybody can do that. I know like one of my knees is not all that great, but I stand as much as I can. Again, it's a sir to you uh, as the GM. The last thing for preparedness, I know this is a lot, right? Um, the last thing for preparedness is bring enough dice. All right, You should bring enough dice that you would be able to supply dice to as many players as were coming to your game. All right, so if you're playing for my games, a lot of my games use just a single d20 for all checks, but that means that for a game of me and six players, I'll bring about 10 d20s. Um, and that's so that people can switch stuff out, that's so that I have some, that's so that everybody has at least one that they can play with, just in case somebody forgot their dice or whatever. There's usually somebody else at the table, too, that's more than willing to help out with that. Uh, but just be sure that you have enough dice for everybody to play with. Now, with those games that you have dice pools and whatnot, um, those actually kind of make it a little bit harder, um, you know, because you don't want to be, you know, walking around with hundreds of dice. But, I mean, if you have room for hundreds of dice, I say go for it because it's only going to uh, benefit you to be able to help out your players uh, in that way. All right, everybody. Step two, introductions. All right. So, first sub-step for introductions. Say hi to everybody. All right. I know that sounds, like, so easy, but I've been at games where people don't say hi. They don't introduce themselves. 
So whenever I'm running a game, I have all the players there, we're ready to start. Um, the first thing I do is I say, hey everybody, uh, my name's Aloy, and I'm here, uh, we're all here to play um, Part-Time Gods, or Ampere One, or whatever we're here to play. Uh, I say, I'm Aloy, I'm going to be your GM today, let's all have a fun time. You know, keep it simple, keep it smiley, you know. Um, you know, if you're enthusiastic and positive about it, um, it's going to do a lot better. But I've had people that say, all right, cool, pick your characters, all right, let's go. And, like, nobody introduced it themselves um, or anything, you know, so it's kind of weird. Um, now that you've told them what your name is, the next step is to get everybody else's names. And this is also something that's just so simple to do. Uh, it's just, you know, it, it creates an awesome rapport with the players, and it's simple. Just go around the table, ask everybody their name. You know, try to remember them as best you can. Some people have weird names. I know, because my name's Aloy. Uh, but, you know, not only uh, should you address them by name during the game, um, but then if you run into them later on at the convention, you can go, oh, Don, that was such a fun game, wasn't it? Yes, it was. That's awesome that you remembered my name. And that's only going to endear you to them. All right. So uh, some GMs are better with faces than they are with names. That's okay. You know, just have some way of addressing each player during the game. Um, it could be that by their name or their character's name or if they've given themselves a nickname or whatever. Um, you can even, you know, make up some quick mnemonic tips, you know, like, uh, like a brief list of players' names with the characters' uh, clothing and so forth. Like Bob Smith um, is playing the burner, uh, wearing a red shirt. Um, you know, that's why it's always good to have a note and paper, but I didn't actually say to have a pen and paper. Anyway, um, so the first thing you want to do, you've introduced the game, you've got everybody's names, they know who you are, you know who they are, now you give the elevator pitch, okay? Like, this is the pitch that you would normally, like, when you're at a booth, you just kind of sell, this is what you use to sell the game, uh, but you want to give it to them as well, because if they haven't played the game, you don't want to just throw a bunch of characters out. You want to be like, all right, so we're playing Apocalypse Prevention, Inc. This is a game where you play agents, you work for a shadow corporation, policing supernatural elements of the world. Best thing about it is the demons work for the company as well. So there's uh, humans and demons working together uh, to protect the Earth, and it's amazing. Let's play. You know, so it's it doesn't take long, but it's good for you to give them a lens to view the pregens through right up front before you even give out the pregens, all right? Next step, hand out the pregens. Um, have at least one pregen per player, uh, but have a few more that are like alternates. Um, that's even better if you can do that. Um, while handing them out, uh, explain which each one is. Like a blind free-for-all can leave some players with characters that they don't really necessarily want to play or that they don't really get. Uh, but introduce each character to the group, like, this is Belinda Jackson, she's a badass human brawler, she's also the leader of the group, like, that's automatic, you know, or like, this is Sam Yang, he's a Teleri computer tech, uh, he's a vampire and a little bit of a coward, so it kind of gives you an idea of what kind of character they're going to be playing. So, the flavor like this is usually enough to make an initial character choice without having to spend a lot of time reading over the whole character. Uh, it also helps to move the session along. Each pregen should be completely filled out um, with provided stats, name, and a brief background to give context to how uh, the character will play during the session. Um, like, even, like, if you write up a small write-up, it'll explain why the stats are the way they are. Um, like, he's a computer tech and he's a little bit of a coward, means he's probably going to have um, high computer skills, uh, but probably low initiative, maybe some combat fear in there. He's not going to be great at a fight. You know what I mean? So it's like it kind of gives the char the player uh, an idea of what they're going to be playing. Um, players should be encouraged to change some aspects of the character if they see fit, um, if it makes it more fun for them. It's a con game. You don't have to stick to the script you know, as, as, as hard as you might want. All right, so the next one is the detailed character background. So once everyone has a character, um, it's time to go a little bit deeper into each character. Now that the player knows that they have a that that a Teleri is a vampire, uh, now's the time to tell them 
Um, all of them, not just the person playing the vampire. Um, you want to tell them how the vampires work in API. Um, now that everybody's picked their god, do you want to tell them, you know, hey, that's that's the god of blood, that's the goddess of blood, and she's like this, and she does cool stuff like this. And you can go through, like, now that the player knows that they're playing a recoiling serpent, which is a snake ninja and a master of poisons, now it's time to get into the character clan gifts and their drawbacks and maybe a few ideas of how best to portray it. Um, and this is not only a way to bring the, the players closer to their characters, uh, but also to draw them deeper into the world, explaining some setting elements. Um, you know, Third Eye Games is, is kind of known for um, our settings, which... I think it's a really cool thing that people are get really, really interested when we start explaining the settings. And again, explaining a little bit of the setting as well as the individual characters gives people uh, an idea of what they're in for. All right. Now, after the detailed character backgrounds, the last thing you want to do is detail the system. Okay, so after all the players are comfortable with their characters and they get the concepts, they understand what's going on in the world and with their characters, run them through the characters' numbers so that they know what each thing means. Like, you want to explain attributes, skills, gifts, drawbacks, explain how the dice work and how difficulties work, and, you know, no matter what system you're running, uh, leave combat alone. Just say... And we'll go over combat whenever we get to it, all right? It lowers the entry bar and doesn't make your game suffer from a huge info dump, all right? So you really just say, these are the things on your character. This is how the dice work. Move on. Shouldn't take more than about five minutes unless people have specific questions uh, about their characters and what's written on their character sheets. And that's actually a good sign that you're doing a good job. They're interested in what's going on. All right, guys. Step three. <laughs> I don't know. Should I have put individual step? I don't know. So step three, the adventure itself. All right. So use a pre-written adventure. All right. This is definitely um, Third Eye Games has adventures in most of the backs of our source books. We have a few that are online for free. Um, so our GMs are very much encouraged to run pre-written adventures for conventions. Um, not only are these uh, adventures pre-written to highlight important aspects of the game world, uh, but players who like the adventure might go buy the book um, that it comes out of uh, so they can run it for their own group. Because, you know, whenever you're running a game at a convention, yes, you're there to have fun. If you're there representing the company, um, then you're there to present the game in the best light possible. Uh, so... You know, it's okay to make small changes to the adventure to fit your pre-gens um, and the choices that the players might make, or they definitely will make, but you should attempt to stick to the adventure as closely as possible without railroading the players. Um, always try to say yes when the players make a choice, um, even if it goes off script, like unless it goes against the concept of the actual character that they're playing, you might want to advise against it, but you know, there's never a reason to really say no, uh, you know, unless it's going to disrupt the game. Uh, but many of the adventures uh, that we write have optional paths that you can take just in case that happens anyway. So it's pretty easy uh, to, to run the adventure. But when you're using a pre-written adventure, like all of the guesswork is done and it becomes kind of foolproof. But if you really, really want to go crazy and say, I want to use a custom adventure, all right? So if you're going to make your own adventure um, or take an adventure and customize it a bunch, um, you're, you're brave. <laughs> you know? uh, taking inspiration from other games or genres is totally okay, uh, but GMs should be sure not to lose the setting itself in the mix. A good way uh, to do this is to pick a particular race or group in the setting and uh, center an adventure around them. So if you need help, um, with that, uh, or just want another eye to even look at it, uh, you should, you know, run it past other GMs. You know, for, if it's one of my games, run the adventure past me, and I can give you kind of my thoughts on it. Um, you know, I can offer advice and whatnot. Uh, obviously, you know, we're not there to dictate what game you run, because, you know, we're not the game police. Um, but again, 
if you are going to run a custom adventure versus a pre-written adventure, it's best that it represent the setting uh, in as good a light as possible. All right, so combat. All right, so tracking combat in any game can be a challenge. All right, so just take a deep breath, stay enthusiastic when explaining all of the rules. Um, you know, but really, you kind of just want to skip it. You want to skip combat until you get to combat and then explain it. All right, so be sure to keep it simple. Uh, so that players don't get lost in all of the options that might be available, depending upon the game as well. Um, a lot of the time I'll say, you know, hey, um, what is it that you would like to do? And they'll say, oh, well, I kind of want to take out my gun and shoot. And I'll say, okay, cool. So this is how that would work. Um, and then they can kind of see it as it's going. So, for example, uh, Wuxing characters... Um, already have a set of standard moves. They also have martial arts moves, and then they have their, um, you know, master jutsu. You know, so it's like if you add in some of the other optional rules and some of the other fighting techniques and stuff like that, it might just be a little bit too much. So you want to make sure um, that you're gauging the group because some players love more options. Um, I've had games where the people just they eat up the mechanics and they're like, so this is how this works and this is how this works? Oh, I'm using this. You know, so um, it's always good to do that. All right, and this is actually, uh, the next one is, is in the back of all of my books that I always say, and I say, be descriptive. All right, there are too many games out there where achievement is quantified by a number. All right, you did four damage, you got 10 on your roll, like, it's it, that's just not enough, all right? So to run a successful game the Third Eye Games way is you need to take that number and describe it. You dealt 10 damage, which means a buckshot that blasted, uh, cracked open the back of the bad guy's skull, and it sprayed blood all over to everybody within 10 feet, and it drips a lot, and it's bleh, you know? And players are always receptive to great descriptions, don't be afraid to ask the players to uh, describe it if they have a better idea. So, you know, oh, well, there's 10 damage. How do you think that happened? You know, what do you think happened? You know, sometimes they know exactly how they want something to go. There's no reason that you can't just ask them, how would you want that to go? And the last uh, thing for running the adventure itself is take a break or two, all right? Um, be sure there's at least one 10-minute break somewhere during the session. Uh, it's best placed in the middle, so if you're running a four-hour block, put it at the two-hour mark and just say, hey, everybody, let's just take a ten-minute real quick. You know, everybody can go take a bio break and um, get a drink and, and whatnot, uh, but make sure it's definitely uh, not going to disrupt the drama or important conflict. It's not going to be something that's going to, you know, get in the middle of what you're doing, but uh, it's always good to kind of take that mental breather in the middle uh, of the session. All right, so you showed up, you introduced everything, you ran an awesome game. So what do you do at the end of the game? Right? You should end the game with a clear indicator that your adventure is over and immediately thank the players for coming and playing. Um, there's a lot of games where I see people go, oh, well, that's the game, and yeah, and then they get up and they go. But no, you know what? You took time out of your day, and it was awesome that you went and ran that game, but they came and played. And if they didn't come and play, you would have had no game to run. So thank them, all right? Forgetting to thank the players, it's a rookie move, and it gives the players the impression um, that their participation wasn't appreciated. Uh, so I know I'm always thankful of people whenever they come and play in my games. Um, so make sure that you say thank you as well. Next to last thing is reward. So not every GM has something to give away at the end, all right? Um, but if you'd like to have something, I know for my games, if you want to have like a t-shirt or a PDF or a phys even a physical copy of the book to give away at a convention that you're going to be running, I know I'll do that. Um, I love giving stuff away. I love giving away t-shirts, bookmarks, coupons. You know, I love giving away stuff. I don't know. I'm just weird that way. Uh, but the best way for, the, for you to do that, like if you have a limited number, would be for you to have the group vote on who they think uh, most deserves the thing that you have to give. The player with the highest votes uh, would get the reward. 
Um, and obviously, if you have more than one reward, then you can give it to the two highest voted players or, you know, whatever, if there's no standout. You know, I like to try and bring enough for everybody, even if it's just a lanyard or something like that. Like, I like to try. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I, <laughs> it's like Christmas whenever I run a game. I like to give stuff away. I'm kind of weird that way. But I know not everybody has that ability. The last thing to do is, is, is if there's time, offer the last bit of time to stick around and answer questions. Um, a lot of the time you'll get people who will come and play in a convention game and they'll have questions, but they don't want to disrupt the session. So they will wait until the end to, an to ask those questions. Uh, so you want to make sure that you um, kind of work in enough time, even if it's just like 10 minutes at the end. Um, just say, hey, you know, if anybody has any questions, if anybody wants to know more about the game, uh, just let me know. And, uh, you know, I'm here for another 10 or 15 minutes. And you will not believe the, that people will come and they will be so appreciative of your time there. Um, and they will be so interested that they'll be like, well, what would have happened in the adventure had we done this? Or, I know that you mentioned this rule, but how did, how would that work? Like, how is that written in the book? You know, um, a lot of people, especially if you ran a good game, um, they're interested in picking up that game for themselves, and they want to know more uh, before they, you know, pull that trigger. Uh, so, definitely, you know, try and stick around and see if you uh, can do that. So, thank you, everybody, for coming and listening to me talk about how to run a convention game the Third Eye Games way. And um, if you like the video, don't forget to like and share and do whatever you do on YouTube. Um, I Hopefully this is really informative for everybody, and hopefully it helps everybody run uh, better games. So have a great one, and I hope to see you again next time.